If you grew up in Great Britain during the 1960s and 1970s, Hammer films were a household name. Their influence on British pop culture often rivaled that of James Bond or Doctor Who, if not the Beatles. However, in the beginning, younger audiences had difficulty in appreciating the gruesome experiments of Peter Cushing's Baron Frankenstein or the hellish sanguinary appeal of Christopher Lee's Count Dracula. Most, if not all, Hammer productions and horror films generally were given the X certificate, meaning no one admitted under the age of 18. And this meant no one. Britain had no equivalent to the modern R restriction found in America when minors can attend the movie, if accompanied by a parent or guardian. Therefore, if you were a horror or fantasy fan under the age of 18, Hammer was considered the forbidden fruit, and you certainly wanted a bite. For those so unfortunate, the closest one could get to Frankenstein's laboratory was to look at still photos in books such as Dennis Gifford's Pictorial History of Horror Films, or the short-lived magazine World of Horror, which lasted only nine issues in 1972 and was aimed at a mainly adult audience. There was also Monster Mag, a full-color fold-out poster magazine filled with lurid and gory photos from current horror movies. We didn't have um, magazines like Famous Monsters of Filmland. Uh, in fact, we didn't have anything really. British comics were very different to American comics and um, there was a big gulf between the kind of pop cultural experiences we had unless you were watching a lot of American TV shows that turned up on British television. All that changed in 1976 thanks to Des Skin, an enterprising, energetic comic book aficionado and editor. By the mid-70s, by way of backtracking a little bit, Des Skin had moved from IPC to work for Williams, which turns out was the UK publishing arm of Warner Brothers, where he was in charge of the youth market publications, including the British edition of Mad Magazine and comic book reprints of Tarzan and Korak, Son of Tarzan. This ultimately led to Skin reviving an idea he had had at IPC to produce a magazine combining horror movies and comics, originally entitled Chiller. Since the Williams editorial offices were situated in the Columbia Warner building in Wardour Street, the heart of the British film industry, and Hammer House, the building where Hammer Films had its offices, were on the same street, Skin had the idea to change the focus of Chiller from horror movies per se to the biggest brand name in British horror, specifically Hammer. House of Hammer was a unique publication. It wasn't just a comics magazine. It was a horror movie magazine with comics, and not just any old horror-type comics. These were comic strip adaptations of Hammer horror films. For an entire generation of British horror fans, it was like discovering the unholy grail. I'll never forget the first time I laid eyes on the magazine and um, I was actually on holiday with my family in South Wales in uh, uh, early summer of 1976 and it was a typical boring British holiday uh, and um, that meant that it rained most of the time we were on vacation so uh, I was running out of things to read because all you could do was sit around the cottage reading or watching TV if there was anything worth watching on TV. You have to remember this is back in the day before the advent of videotape so there were no uh, VHS recorders, you couldn't um, go to Blockbuster or your local mum and pop video store to rent something. Uh, it was either watch whatever was on BBC TV or ITV or go to the local Odeon or ABC theatre if there was something worth seeing. Anyway, so I you know, walked into this uh, post office come news agents, that's Brit speak for newsstand, uh, hoping to find some books or some comics or something to entertain myself while it was raining again. And I found the first two issues of House of Hammer. It was like finding the Holy Grail. I, I grabbed them off the shelf, skimmed through them really quickly, didn't even bother to look at the details, uh, went straight to the counter, slapped my money down, went straight back uh, to the cottage and uh, didn't say a word to my family for the next several hours. And I think I must have read those two issues cover to cover uh, at least twice a day for the rest of the holiday and uh, I couldn't wait to get back to quote civilization and uh, actually go running off to my local news news agents and uh, 
find out whether they were going to be stocking it and put in an order so that I could get every issue because it was like this was this was the must buy magazine every month. The magazine was truly a bloody feast for the eyes, but it was more than Hammer's gallery of horrors that influenced them. House of Hammer benefited with starting with issue two, uh, the terrific work of artist Brian Lewis, who produced a whole series, virtually all of the covers up until issue 23, are uh, beautiful, beautiful paintings inspired by the Hammer movie, whatever one was being adapted that month. Lewis was an artist who had been very active in the late 50s and early 60s and had done a whole series of beautiful uh, painted covers for paperbacks, for science fiction magazines, etc. and had also done a fair amount of comic strip artwork in different publications. But those covers for House of Hammer really made, made the magazine and the quality of those painted covers truly reflected the quality of the work that you were going to find inside from the comics adaptations to the quality of the writing. For House of Hammer's comics, Des Skin assembled a variety of visionary artists like Paul Neary, Brian Bolland and John Bolton, long before they were discovered by American comics companies such as Marvel and DC. The illustrations were vividly and beautifully drawn in the cinematic style of the original Hammer productions, and for good reason. Des Skin and his team worked closely with Michael Carreras himself, who became head of Hammer Films after buying out his father, Sir James Carreras. This allowed the House of Hammer team access to studio studio archives as well as the use of original scripts before the films actually began shooting. This unique opportunity made it possible to present all the mood and power of such now classic films as Horror of Dracula and Dracula Prince of Darkness, as well as the Hammer Shaw martial arts shocker Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires. Some adaptations, like Paul Neary's stunning Moon Zero Two, a rare Hammer excursion into science fiction that came out in 1969, actually looked better than the film itself. Alongside these entertaining comics adaptations, the magazine also published original short stories, as well as essays on modern horror cinema. Also contributing to the magazine was veteran uh, movie journalist Tony Crawley, uh, who was also the editor of Cinema X magazine, which he used to almost single-handedly write. It was thanks to House of Hammer that I first heard of Toby Hooper's The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh, thanks to a wonderful article written by journalist John Fleming. Uh, it was like, what is this? You know, uh, it was um, it was groundbreaking. It was a real breath of fresh air. There have since been other magazines devoted to Hammer and British horror, but House of Hammer can now be seen as the British equivalent to Ackerman's Famous Monsters of Filmland, the first of its kind. Its initial run of 23 brilliantly conceived issues was a cinematic lightning rod for an entire generation of stormy British horror fans. And although the magazine was revived a few years later with a different editor, Dave reader who did a fine job uh, the magazine was not it wasn't it wasn't as great as it was in its heyday. Des Skin, its enigmatic creator, would later become the head of Marvel Comics operations in England, as well as acquire the BBC license for Doctor Who Weekly, which was awarded the Guinness World Record for the longest running magazine based on a television series. After leaving Marvel, he founded and edited Warrior, which featured key works from the then unknown Alan Moore. This would include the first installments of the highly popular V for Vendetta, the title of which was devised by Skin himself. Dear Skin would go on to establish one of Britain's few science fiction magazines, Starburst, as well as author several books, including the renowned 2004 opus Comics, The Underground Revolution. Today, he continues to be the managing director of Quality Communications Limited, the company he founded in 1981 as a vehicle for launching properties, establishing copyright and brand awareness, and multimedia licensing. Forty years after he first entered the business as a professional, Des Skin continues to be an influential figure in the British publishing world.